Suppose I told you that the current King of France was coming for dinner tonight. How do we make sense of that knowing that there's no such person? This is a problem in philosophy of language, in linguistics, and it's somewhere that formal logic can really help out. Let's see how. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to Attic Philosophy. This is a series of videos introducing the basic concepts of formal logic. In previous videos, we've introduced first order logic, we've introduced identity in logic. This video is going to be about how we can use identity in logic to analyse, to help solve tricky linguistic expressions like the present King of France. So we're going to try and whiz quickly through a bit of the logic, a bit of the philosophy and a bit of the linguistics. If you're finding these intro to logic videos useful, why not subscribe to the channel and get all the updates? We're going to talk about definite descriptions. So a definite description is a phrase like the lecturer or the first song I heard this morning, which is intended to pick out a particular person or a particular thing. So in the previous video, we were talking about identity in first order logic. And throughout this video, what we're going to look at is how we can use identity in order to analyze definite descriptions. But before we do that, I want to take you through some philosophical issues with definite descriptions, with their analysis, to see why it's important to have this logical analysis of definite descriptions, OK? Because there is a genuine philosophical linguistic problem there. So this problem of definite descriptions was first raised by Bertrand Russell in his famous 1905 paper on denoting. So I'm going to run through the issue more or less as Russell ran through it. So consider a definite description like the current female Labour leader, OK, leader of the Labour Party in the UK. The issue with that description is there's no such person, OK? The current Labour leader's male, not female. So what do we mean when we use an expression like the current female Labour leader? OK, so we're talking about an empty description here, a description that doesn't pick out someone in the world because there's no such person. OK, so there's a little bit of a puzzle there. Exactly what does this mean? What do we make sense of these empty descriptions? But the way Russell pushed the problem is like this. Suppose someone says the current female Labour leader is a socialist. Well, that's not true because there's no such person. But then you don't want to say that the current female Labour leader isn't a socialist. I mean, it's not like they're a right winger or something because there's still no such person. OK, so it seems like we don't want to assert the truth of that person's a socialist, but nor do we want to assert its negation. That person isn't a socialist. Neither of these two seem to be true. And yet logic says one of them's got to be true because that's the law of excluded middle. Either a sentence or its negation is true. Russell was saying, how do we put these things together? How do we square these things? How do we square this law of logic, either a sentence or its negation is true, with the fact that in the case of the current female Labour leader is a socialist or isn't a socialist, we don't want to assert either. And by the way, this isn't a case where it's just because we're not sure which. We're pretty sure that both of them are wrong, OK, because we know that there is no such person. Now, although Russell puts the problem in terms of the conflict with the law of excluded middle, it's not like that's the only problem, OK, with definite descriptions. Some logicians, they don't accept the law of excluded middle. So, for instance, intuitionistic logicians or people who accept a many-valued logic, they don't accept that A or not A is always valid. But it's not like they have no problem with definite descriptions. The underlying problem is... How can we make sense of definite descriptions so that phrases like this, the current female Labour leader, they remain meaningful, even though they're not picking out anyone? So Russell wasn't just raising a problem. He was solving it. So according to Russell's analysis, a definite description, the F is G. So something like the lecturer is tall means firstly, there's exactly one F. There's exactly one lecturer and they're G and they're tall. Using what we learned about identity in first order logic in the previous video, we know we can express it like this. Remember, this thing says both that there's at least one F and at most one F. 
So it's saying that this x is the only f. And it's also saying that the x is g. So there's exactly one f, there's a unique f, and that person is g. So Russell was using this logical analysis to spell out the logical form of the definite description, the f. The f might sound like a referring expression, like a name, like Bob or whatever. But on Russell's analysis, it's not. Actually, it's a sentence. There's exactly one f. Something that can be simply true or false. And in the case of the current female Labour leader, it's clearly false because this says there is such a person and there isn't. So according to Russell, the definite description, the current female Labour leader is a socialist, would be false. Russell's analysis solves the problem of the law of excluded middle in a really nice way. Because although this sentence is false, its negation is true. Its negation is this sentence, okay? It's not the case that there is a unique person who is leader of the Labour Party, female and socialist. And that's true. There really is no such person. So we have a false sentence and its negation is true. So that's perfectly OK with the law of excluded middle. The other sentence that we were worried about, the current female Labour leader isn't a socialist, is this sentence. OK, this one is false too. The current Labour leader isn't a socialist. That's false because there's no such person. But notice that this sentence isn't the negation of this one. OK, to negate this sentence, we put the negation here. This sentence is expressed with the negation here. So this sentence is saying there's exactly one current female Labour leader and she isn't a socialist. Well, that sentence implies that there is such a person and that's false. So the Russellian analysis tells us that this sentence is false, this one is true, this one is false, and that matches up with what we said about those definite descriptions. So that seems like a pretty good analysis. And I think it's worth saying that at the time when Russell gave this analysis, 1905, logic, at least modern first order logic, was a kind of a new thing. So this is one of the first times that somebody had come out with a logical analysis of a problem, of a piece of language or whatever, and said, look, using this logic, I can solve deep philosophical metaphysical problems. Russell was in part replying to metaphysicians like Meinong, people who thought that we solve problems like this by positing extra entities, entities which don't exist. So they would say, well, there kind of is this current female Labour leader. It's just somebody who doesn't exist. They, they, there are such things. They're just not real people or something like that. Russell was saying, no, 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 we don't need metaphysical entities like that, because once we get the right logical analysis of the language, we see that the problem goes away. So this was really a first use of what became analytic philosophy, taking a deep philosophical metaphysical problem and using logic to analyse it. And once we get the analysis and we look at it, we see its logical form, actually the problem goes away. So that's actually one of the historical ideas behind what became 20th century analytic philosophy. Whether you think that worked out as a good thing or not, I mean... So there you have the Russellian, the logical analysis of definite descriptions. I want to take you through two philosophical, linguistic worries or problems with that logical analysis, with the Russellian analysis. So the first problem comes about not because the thing that we're trying to talk about doesn't exist, but because there are too many of them. So if we went to a class together and I said, I think the lecturer is really good. According to the Russellian analysis, that means there's exactly one lecturer. But there's not, right? There's like thousands of lecturers in the world. So it seems like on the Russellian analysis, I'm, I'm saying that there's only one lecturer in the world, which is obviously false. How could I be saying something so crazy? Obviously, that's not what I'm saying. So it seems like we have a problem for the Russellian analysis here. However, there is an important logical linguistic idea which helps us solve this problem. The idea is known as quantifier domain restriction. So to build up to this idea, let's think back to when we introduced the idea of quantifiers in first order logic and we introduced the domain of quantification. Whenever we're using quantifiers, 
there is a domain that we're quantifying over. And that domain won't always be everything in the entire world, okay? Sometimes we will just be talking about a very specific set of things. Now, that's a logical idea. That's part of formal logic. The linguistic idea is that in any conversation we might be having, context plays a large role. So the, the things that we say, but also the setting we find ourselves in, that plays a large role in affecting lots of parameters of the conversation, including what's the domain of quantification. So as we talk or as we change our setting, the domain of quantification might expand, contract or whatever. In particular, if we start talking about, for instance, that lecture we went to last week, then the domain of quantification shrinks down, maybe temporarily, to people in that lecture. So when I say the lecturer, I'm now quantifying not over everyone in the world, but just over the people in that lecture. And then there was one and only one lecturer. So that's how I managed to pick out the unique lecturer using that definite description. OK, and notice because this is happening contextually, I don't explicitly have to say, oh, the, the lecturer of the, the lecture last week. The context, the background does all of that. So we start talking about that lecturer. I say, I thought the lecturer was really good. And I managed to pick out that person. The domain of quantification has shrunk down enough so that we can pick out a unique person. So this linguistic idea of context playing a large role in helping us make sense of what we're saying, this is not new and this is not something that only crops up when we're using quantifiers. OK, so it's a very general phenomenon, but we can apply it specifically here to make sense of definite descriptions on the Russellian analysis. So I think that's a really good way of trying to avoid this problem. Does it really avoid the problem? Well, some people think there are cases where the domain of quantification obviously includes two or more of the thing you're talking about. So a definite description on the Rosselli analysis shouldn't work, but it does work. So if there are such cases, they're genuinely going to be a problem for the Rossellian analysis. The second issue I want to talk about for the Rossellian analysis of definite descriptions concerns presuppositions. So let's talk a little bit about presuppositions in language. Often, if we make an assertion or ask a question, there are, there are certain presuppositions involved. So if I ask you, did you close the window, but the window was closed all along, it's not like you would say yes or no. You would say, well, that doesn't make sense. The window was always closed. It didn't need closing. So this is a case where we have presupposition failure. The question presupposes that the window was open, but if that's false, if the window was always closed, we have presupposition failure. And when there's a presupposition failure, it seems like the appropriate response to a question isn't yes or no, but what does that mean? Similarly, in the case of declarative sentences, which we normally evaluate as true or false, many philosophers of language think that when the sentence comes with a presupposition or when an utterance of it comes with a presupposition which isn't met, that sentence should no longer be treated as one that's true or false. Rather, it should be treated as a failure of presupposition so neither true nor false. And many people think this is the right thing to say about non-denoting empty definite descriptions like the current female labour leader. If I start talking about the current female labour leader, I am presupposing or my utterances are presupposing that there is such a person. But there isn't. We've got presupposition failure. So on this presupposition theory, it's going to predict that my utterances she's a socialist or she's not a socialist, won't be true, they won't be false, they will be truth valueless. OK, the appropriate response if I say she's a socialist isn't to agree, isn't to disagree, but it's to point out that there's a problem. There is no such person. This presupposition theory of definite descriptions seems to match lots of our intuitions. After all, if I tell you about this current female Labour leader, it's not that you're going to start getting into a political argument with me. You're just going to point out that there is no such person. So speakers intuitions, the kind of thing that we use as data in linguistics, they seem to favour the presupposition theory. And insofar as they do, it seems to be a problem for the Rossellian analysis, because after all, on the Rossellian analysis, the description, the current female Labour leader is a socialist. Uh, 
that's just simply false. So the Russellian view says that's false, whereas our intuitions seem to indicate that it's neither true nor false, it's something else. Now, if that's the case, yeah, it looks like we have a problem with the Russellian analysis. What we could do is we could use that Russellian analysis not to give the content or logical form of the definite description, but to spell out its presupposition. So the presupposition of saying the current Labour female leader is socialist, the presupposition of that would be that there is a unique such person. But as to what the exact content of the definite description is, then that would be up for grabs. However, just to make things even more complicated, it's not really clear that all of our intuitions, that all of the data does support this kind of theory. So there are other intuitions which seem to push the other way in favour of the Russellian analysis. So, for instance, if I change the example a bit and say the current female Labour leader is sitting in this chair. Well, obviously she's not. I mean, that's just simply false. Or ask yourself this. Are you going to be having dinner with the current female Labour leader this evening? No, of course not. There's no such person. So in those cases, our intuition, our reaction seems to be, no, that's false. So there we are treating the utterance, even though there's a failed presupposition, we're treating it as being straightforward false, in accordance with the Russellian analysis. So some data seems to support the Russellian analysis, but there's also a lot of data which doesn't. So it's really hard to know which theory wins here. OK, guys, so that wraps up this little discussion of definite descriptions, the philosophy surrounding them, the linguistics surrounding them, and how using identity in first order logic can at least help us understand what they mean. I hope you found this interesting. If you have, consider subscribing to the channel. If you have any questions, leave me a comment below. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.